Hello everyone, welcome to our lesson this week on Confucianism. This first video will be a short introduction. So, the question we looked at last week as our introduction to Buddhism was the following. Have you ever been overwhelmed, trapped by suffering? And hopefully now, after having digested Buddhism, this question uh, might uh, make a little more sense to you. As we go into Confucianism, the question I'd like you to think about as we begin discussing this topic is the following. Have you ever felt like you're immersed in chaos, as if uh, everything around you was hectic and you weren't too sure how to, to make sense or to deal with all of it? So as with the previous two discussions on Hinduism and Buddhism, I'd like to begin with a, a short tour of Confucianism. But when I mention Confucianism, does anything particular come to mind? Do any particular images or artifacts or ideas come to mind? Rather than a tour, like in the previous lectures, what I'd like to do is to go through some of the various Chinese religions or traditions that kind of lead us to Confucianism. Because Confucianism comes out of China uh, immersed in various other traditions. So a lot of what we think of as being associated with Confucianism stems from or is rooted in other traditions that were in China before Confucianism. So, thousands of years, there have been obviously many indigenous spiritual traditions within China with various different practices. And we'll look into the, some of those practices and see how they uh, later became part or associated with Confucianism. A lot of these practices have to do with divination, um, the belief in spirits, ancestor worship, so as we take a look at Confucianism, oftentimes they might be associated with these sorts of phenomena, but uh, Confucian, Confucius himself um, didn't necessarily advocate or invent or come up with these sorts of practices. They're already within the Chinese culture prior to his teachings. Similarly, before Confucianism, Taoism was already popular within China. And when we think of um, uh, Taoist philosophy, when we start to delve into the nature of, of reality within Taoism and the notion of opposites being part of the whole, uh, sometimes these sorts of concepts also find their way in, Confucian, um, in Confucianism. Yeah, but again, Confucius didn't necessarily come up with these sorts of ideas or practices or these sorts of philosophies. Confucianism, we can see as originating within the 4th century BCE. So this is after um, um, the establishment of various indigenous folk religions and after the establishment of Taoism. And uh, Confucianism is even a little bit before Buddhism. So one major question that may have even come up for you when looking at Buddhism is asking whether or not this is really a religion. When we took a look at Buddhism, we heard a lot of um, teachings based upon cognition, based upon how the mind works. And for many people, it felt more like a psychology or more of a philosophy than it does what we normally think of religion, especially on the West, where we associate religion with worshiping of deities, worshiping of, of the supernatural. While there is some of that within certain branches of Buddhism, it's not a part of the fundamental teaching of the Buddha. At least for many, for many uh, practitioners, it's not. Um, the same applies to Confucianism. There's a debate about whether or not Confucianism is, is really a religion as opposed to a, a philosophy or, or a way of life. And again, the, the, um, the lines between these sorts of ideas, religion versus culture versus, um, versus uh, philosophy versus a psychology. I mean, the lines between all of these sorts of distinctions are a little blurred. And maybe this is something to keep in mind as we start to delve into even more of these things that we call religions. But within Confucianism, we often sometimes, we often see uh, statues of, the, of Confucius. Um, and from the outside in, that may make Confucius seem like a deity, though he really is not. There are various temples honoring Confucius, but again, this may seem as if it's worshiping a deity, but 
but it's not. It's as if it's akin to having statues of historical figures. So if you if you walk around various historical landmarks within the U.S., you'll see statues of Abraham Lincoln, statues of Muhammad Ali, statues of. It's not necessarily saying that these people are 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 gods or goddesses. It's a matter of honoring various people that we feel have impacted our culture. Same thing with Confucius. And when we look at Confucius' teachings, um, there there is no mention of, there's not a specific mention of deity, spirits, or devotion to higher powers. Though, since Confucius lived within China uh, uh, and immersed in various folk religions and Taoism, the language he uses will refer to um, spirits, will refer to things that may seem supernatural, but it's not at the root or the heart of his teachings. What we do see, though, which makes Confucius a very large figure within not just Chinese history, but with world history, is that based upon his teachings, he gave people meaning and order for several thousands of years. So when we take a look at how Confucianism uh, is influenced by various traditions already based in China, uh, we see things like his frequent reference to heaven, Tian. It, the notion of heaven here isn't so much uh, a place like we often think about it in, in the Christian tradition. It's more of uh, the source of uh, law or the source of our virtue. It's, it's uh, sometimes uh, Confucius will often, refer, sometimes Confucius will refer to how we are, are watched by heaven or how our actions are seen by heaven. Um, and so sometimes the language comes across as if heaven's treated as a, a person, though that's not really how Confucius is using the term. It's more of that from which we are given purpose, that from which we are uh, given um, values. It's, it's a very philosophical sort of idea here. Also, part of the folk religion that made its way into Confucianism is ancestor reverence, which means there, we, we, there's this belief that the dead can influence what we do, can influence our lives. So lots of practices within Chinese folk religions have to do with appeasing the spirits of the deceased, especially appeasing the spirits of deceased loved ones, hoping that they can have a positive influence what we do. Hence, there'll be... Uh, use of incense in the worshiping or providing food at altars or food at grave sites. Also within folk religion that finds its way into Confucianism is the notion of divination. And this is the ability to um, receive information or receive knowledge from uh, some, some, some sort of spiritual source through some sort of spiritual mean. And maybe the most popular method of this is through the I Ching, which is the Book of Changes. And the I Ching, in, in, uh, one way to think of, of the I Ching is kind of a, um, a, kind of a dictionary, uh, a fortune telling sort of dictionary. And what you'd often see are people using coins or sticks like we see in the image here and tossing them or shaking them, and the results of the coins or the results of the sticks are an answer to a question you posed. So let's say you asked a question about what to do with a certain financial situation or what to do um, with the decision you're about to make with regards to who you're gonna marry or an occupational change. So you shake the sticks or the coins and then you let them fall or you randomly pick them up and the random assortment corresponds to various different answers that can be found in the I Ching. And you look those answers up in the I Ching and then you read what they correspond to. And the idea is that the answer you see can be gleaned by reading that uh, the meaning of your, of your divination. So all of these were in place in China prior to the growth of Confucianism. So when we think of Confucianism, 
the heart of it aren't these elements. It's not at the heart of Confucianism isn't divination, isn't ancestor worship, um, isn't the notion of heaven. And again, because of these because of these things being part of China during the time period, Confucius will use the language, will speak in terms of of these sorts of cultural artifacts so that the people can understand where he's coming from, what he's trying to say, so that he can influence them to change. But Confucian, Confucius himself never thought of himself as anything more than a civil servant. So as to a divine sage or even a good man, far be it from me to make any such claim. As for unvarying effort to learn and unflagging patience in teaching others, those are merits I do not hesitate to claim. So he saw himself more as a, a teacher, more of a servant to the state, a civil servant to, to the people, much more than, than anything supernatural or divine. Now, what is Confucianism? In a very, very general sense, it's simply the teachings of Confucius. And just like we saw with Buddhism, where Buddha isn't the, isn't the, the name of the person, just the title, the same thing here is true of Confucius. Confucius is just the Latinized version of Kung Fu Tzu, or the Master Kung. So, uh, Kung is the uh, the name. It's a it's a, uh, the name of this person's clan, or it's the the name of the branch of his ancestry. So, the the uh, term Confucius just refers to him as being the master, uh, the master teacher. Right? So he was a civil servant. And because of what he wanted to do for the people, because of what he saw happening to society, he thought he could best serve by teaching, by teaching his brand, his particular philosophy that he helped, he thought could help bring together uh, the culture, bring together um, China. So what does this mean, bring together? Well, for a very, very long time, China, ancient China, was ruled by various dynasties. And in some sense, when you think of being ruled by a dynasty, uh, when we look at it from our democratic society, it seems like it could be, could be ripe for, um, for misuse of power. It seems like it could be uh, uh, a, a form of society lacking freedom. And all these sorts of things existed. That's true. But within a dynasty, you also have order, right? You also have cohesion. But after a while, a dynasty began to crumble and China began to split into all these different warring tribes. So this is known as the warring states period in China, where the, the, the Zhao Chao dynasty split because of the because of internal strife. And what we had was this huge, um, huge chaotic form of a society, complete anarchy, where we had all these tribes, all these different states fighting each other ruthlessly because there's no more overarching um, sovereignty. The stories from this time period are, are pretty horrendous, where uh, uh, these different states and these different tribes would be very ruthless towards each other. Um, some stories include people cutting off heads of their enemies, and making the relatives drink their uh, the blood from their brains, and you know all these sorts of horrific acts. So uh, Confucius thought to himself, "There has to be a better way than this." And uh, it is through this sort of motivation that he began to formulate certain theories and philosophies that he thought could bring about dramatic change to alleviate the suffering that resulted from this warring states period. So a little bit more about Confucius as, as a person. Um, he was a, a big admirer of the order that existed under the dynasties, right? especially under the glory days of the, the, Zhao, the Zhao, Zhao dynasty. And he noticed that what seemed to keep people together was tradition was some sort of custom so this gave him a seed that in order to make change in order to bring about change what he'd have to do would be to establish new customs 
would be to establish new traditions. So uh, as a civil servant, he tried to promote this sort of philosophy to anyone who would listen to him. Hey, we need to, we need to establish new traditions. We need to establish new customs in order to, to bring ourselves out from this muck. And it, people didn't really listen to him. So instead, he became a teacher. And he thought, if I just taught, maybe if I can teach enough people, then those students can help spread this sort of philosophy. And as it turned out, that's what happened. Unfortunately. His teachings became popular uh, after he passed, so he never really got to see the fruits of his of his labor. Um, uh, what had happened is, as a result of people listening to him, people learning from him, understanding his philosophies, those students would eventually bring about new traditions, right? New customs, exactly as Confucius had had wanted. The idea then is that these customs, these traditions have to go through the civic process. These would have to be things that would have to be slowly accepted by various cities, states, and put into education, put into the educational system so that uh, people, kids growing up, will learn these as the way things are, right? This is how life is supposed to be. So what did Confucius teach? What were the fundamental ideas and philosophies that um, molded and helped stabilize the society in China for thousands of years, and even for a lot of Asia? That's what we'll talk to or talk about in the next in the next video.